But uh, from what he told me, he went in and I want to say probably very early 44, the end of 43, and he was up north working in the woods. And I guess he, he always thought it was good that he went in as he was old, that he was older because he said, you know, they didn't, the young kids, they could kind of brainwash them that, you know, you guys are the baddest bastards in the world and, you know, you're going over there and kick some ass. Well, he said, what do you think the guys over there were telling their soldiers, you know? And he said, the, the old man, they always called the, the guy the captain or whatever he was, the, you know, the guys call him the old man. He says, he always knew that he wasn't going to bullshit me so much because I was a little bit older. I was 26 or something like that when he went in. So he said, I, I kind of got, you know, and then he was a barber in there for a while. He said, when, yeah, when he was in uh, camp, boot camp, I guess, or some camp before they shipped out to go over to England and then into France. You know, he says, I was a barber. And he says, didn't have to know much. He said, just cut everybody's hair about that tall, <laughs> he said. <laughs> but uh, he went into... Um, that deal about Luxembourg was the only time he really had any time off. He said otherwise they had him on the move all the time. And he, they couldn't keep enough gas for those tanks that were, because they were really pushing the Germans back at that point, you know, late in the war. And late 44, I think it was around October or something, they started heading back because they were, you know, already getting their ass kicked over there in Russia and starving and freezing. And then so now they're trying to fight on two fronts. and. And he said they were really moving. He said sometimes we'd move 25 miles a day and sometimes we'd move 25 feet. <laughs> well, you know, just depending on the battles. So uh, when that battle actually happened, when he got hit on the first day of January in 45, he was telling me that the uh, captain or whoever it was that was kind of back, and he would call up tanks and it, there was some action going on in front of him. And he said, uh, 017, go up and engage the enemy. And this guy would go up there and they had to go up this little incline and their belly was exposed, but they had no armor on their belly. And he says, Grace, I watched two tanks just get blown right the hell off the, you know, earth. And he says, he told me, he says, uh, you know, whatever his number was, 015, go up there, you know, go up there and engage the enemy. And he says, I can't, sir. And he says, what's the problem? I'm out of ammunition. So he went back to the lines and got mm -hmm. ammunition for, I guess, for the big gun. And uh, they had a 76, I believe, on the front. And he was, he said, we were all gunned because the Germans had those 88s on their tanks. You know, he said, I they could shoot at us two miles before we were in range to shoot at them. So he said it was kind of like they had an advantage. So he went back and got ammo, and he came back up, and he said it was getting pretty hot. He said the, it was a hell of a battle. And, he, and one thing he told, told me, he said, you could tell if there was a little um, firefight somewhere. He said you could hear the, the American soldiers had their Thompsons and be mm -hmm. like, and he, he says it would be like, gunk, 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 and all you hear, brr, brr, and that was those little smitzers that the Germans had. He said they were fully automatic, and ours were semi-automatic. So he said you could tell which side, and then if you didn't hear the clunk, 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 pretty soon you figured that that guy probably got it. But he said you could just tell which side and where they were. And uh, so, you know, and then when they got up, he, when this battle was going on, he said it was getting pretty hot and he said I told the assistant driver he was the tank commander the driver and he said I told him to open the escape hatch he said I just had a feeling that you know this was gonna something that could go wrong and they took a, a shell and I said well, what'd you get hit by and was it a tank or he said I don't know he said it could have been a big field piece back two three miles back or could have been a there was panzers and, and tiger tanks yeah. in the area but he said I don't even know what we got hit by but he said uh, when they got hit, he crawled out of that escape hatch, and that, I said, well, did everybody get out? And he says, I don't know. He was bleeding bad. He had got head wounds mm -hmm. from shrapnel, and uh, he crawled. He said, I crawled as far as away as I could, and then I kind of, like, blacked out. And I laid there, and, and he said, think after a while, things calmed down, and the guys came up, you know, corpsmen to bring wounded back and stuff, and he said he kind of was in a semi-conscious state. He said, I heard him one guy say, well, you don't need to rush on this one. They thought he was dead because mm -hmm. he had so much blood around his head and stuff. And he he said his eyes were just crusted shut because he had blood all through his eyes and then of course it coagulated. And anyhow, he just, uh, you know, he heard him you know, saying, you know, they were trying to get the wounded out of there first and they'd get the dead afterwards. And he uh, grunted or something or moved and they got him out of there and he, um, he laid in the hospital, he told me, I, I, he didn't say exactly how long or if he told me, I don't remember, but I'm going to say six, eight months. He was in England in a hospital convalescing, 
And when he came back to the States then, he was in uh, Battle Creek, Michigan. They had, must have had a military hospital okay. over there. And then that's where he met Luella. She was a nurse there. And, you know, him being a womanizer and her being a young, good-looking <laughs> gal, that's how that came about. But uh, he, uh, I said, did you ever see any of those guys afterwards? Because, you know, and then it got kind of later on, it got popular for these guys to have, you know, times when they get back together yeah. or certain groups and stuff. And he said, no, I don't know where any of them are or if they got out of there alive or not. He didn't know. But in about late 70s, maybe it could have been as early as 81, 82, he was having some trouble with his shrapnels by his temple. And uh, he went to see a doctor and it was starting to work its way out. They had taken a lot out, you know, when he was in the hospital after the battle. But he went down to Oshkosh to the CP Street Clinic and they removed some uh, shrapnel that had started working its way out right by his temple. And he had a bandage on for a couple weeks. And he had those little pieces of shrapnel that they took out, the uh, doctor gave them to him. And it was just little pieces of steel either from shell fragments or something from the inside of the tank that just blew up and stuff, but uh, it was something he always carried around. And, you know, it was like, a, like his souvenir, because when he came out of, out of Europe, he says, I just came out on a, on a stretcher, and he says, I should, I didn't, I wasn't able to take anything with me, you know, even my own personal belongings, and he didn't know if the tank actually burned and blew up or not. He got, he crawled away as far as he could because he was afraid it would blow up. They were gasoline powered. And he said, I just, I, I just wanted to get as far away as I could. And he said, he said, I don't even know if I was crawling back toward our lines or the other way. He said, I just wanted to get away from that tank. And I suppose with that blood, you know, you, you blurring his see. vision, you know, and you're in shock, you just want to get the hell out of there. You don't care which way you, I guess, you know, being taken prisoner that late in the war, they knew it was going bad for Germany. Um, I, even t being taken prisoner would have been better than laying next to that tank and blowing yeah. up, you know, you'd take your chances, so. But uh, yeah, they got him out of there then, and I, it was a while in England. He laid in a hospital over there for a good long time, it sounded like. And then I'm gonna say maybe that same amount of time in Battle Creek, probably six, eight months. Con convalescing, as he called it. I guess that's really what it is. That's what they called it then, you know. But uh, um, he didn't talk about it a lot until as he started getting older, you know. It was, I think he thought nobody cared, you know, like uh, yeah, us young guys didn't have any interest because, you know, you didn't know that much about it. And, and then he started realizing that I would read, I was always reading books about World War II, Civil War, Custer's stuff. Yeah. And he realized that I had an interest in it. So then he would open up when he was in the mood to, to talk about it. And you couldn't bring it on, to, you know, you couldn't mm -hmm. get him to talk about it. But when he was ready, he would. And if I'd be sitting out in the shop with him and stuff, well, then uh, he would... Uh, Sometimes you would just let go and just talk about, you know, and like I said, I was telling you that one day I walked in and he was getting real sentimental and he says, Pat, I wish you could have been there. <laughs> and I thought, well, I'm kind of glad I wasn't, but if somebody hadn't been there, we'd probably all be speaking German by now. So. <laughs>